Hi, my name is Irene Godoy. I am an Alexander von Humboldt postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. Welcome to my presentation on assessing social and genetic influences on sociality. The past two decades has amassed a large body of literature showing links between sociality and non-human primates and biological fitness. In baboons, macaques, and capuchins, for example, various aspects of sociality, such as relationship quality or connectedness, have been shown to map onto higher offspring survival, higher reproductive output, or increased survival. Similar findings have also been found in other mammalian taxa, such as giraffes, marmots, and cetaceans. If variation in sociality can lead to variation in biological fitness, then a logical question to ask is, what explains why some individuals are more socially integrated in their groups while others are more socially isolated? This is a complicated question that will necessitate many different types of analyses to answer, but I want to begin that journey with an understanding about how we can disentangle intrinsic versus extrinsic sources of variation in sociality. A first step in this journey is understanding how consistent or repeatable individuals are in their behavior. This can be in the short term, such as over the course of one field season, but also in the long term with repeat sampling over the course of the lifespan. Can we discern the extent to which repeatability in behavior is due to intrinsic causes, such as maternal effects or additive genetic sources of variation? Concurrently, can we also estimate the degree to which variation in our behavior of interest is due to variation in social or physical environments of individuals? Answering these questions is a complicated undertaking because it necessitates data from various sources and across long periods of time. To understand variation in a behavioral trait, we need observational data and a lot of it. To understand maternal or additive genetic contributions to variation, we need pedigrees and preferably deep ones. And to understand variation across the lifespan, we need a longitudinal study. Fortunately, I am able to tackle these questions because I work in collaboration with a long-term field site studying a highly social non-human primate. My study species is the white-faced capuchin monkey, and I will present data collected from the Lomas Barbulao population in Costa Rica, a population that has been under intense observational study since 1990. Capuchins are a long-lived species with a long juvenile period. In captivity, they can live up to 55 years. In the wild, we estimate that individuals can live well into their 30s. Females reach sexual maturity around five to six years of age, and males somewhat later. In capuchins, there's a well-established pattern of high male reproductive skew. Genetic data from two different long-term studies on capuchins at Lomas Barbulal and at nearby Santa Rosa has established that alpha males sire the majority of infants. Importantly, alpha males can retain their rank for long stretches of time. This leads to complex kinship structure in capuchins with generational overlap and an abundance of close kin, particularly with respect to full versus half maternal siblings and paternal sibships that are not constrained within cohorts. I'm going to present to you behavioral data collected from group scan sampling. During a scan, we record the identity of an individual. We also record the identity of any other monkey within approximately four meters of that subject. Using proximity data, we can generate a very coarse grained measure of sociality based on whether or not an individual subject is social or alone. Our proximity data can be turned into a sociality measure compiled by month, where we compare the time a subject spends social with the time a subject spends alone. If we were to look at this sociality measure as a proportion, the proportion of time spent social, we would see that our sociality measure is normally distributed in our population with on average individuals spending just a little over half of their time near others. Thanks to the non-invasive collection of fecal samples from which we later extract DNA, 
We know maternal and paternal links from most of the monkeys that are natal to our study groups. This is really wonderful genetic information with genotyping at up to 18 microsatellite markers. It allows us to confirm the identities of individuals' mothers and to assign paternities. For some individuals, we now have pedigree links going back six generations. Now we can combine our behavioral data with our genetic data. With group scan sampling since 2001, we have proximity data spanning 20 years. The data come from 365 subjects across 11 study groups. Since our sociality measure is compiled by month, we have over 21,000 monkey months as data points for our analyses. On average, we have nearly five years of sampling per subject, but with 12% of our subjects represented by over a decade of sampling. Our pedigree links 411 individuals and contains hundreds of maternities, paternities, and sibships. In order to partition different sources of variation for our behavioral trait, we ran a generalized linear mix model using the MCMC GLMM package in R. The statistical method we use is known as an animal model, and it allows us to estimate additive genetic sources of variation. Our models include fixed effects. We account for the interaction between age and sex, for group size, and for seasonality, which is represented by taking the sine and cosine of a modified month term. Average group size in our population is about 25 individuals. Age was included as a categorical variable representing five developmental stages. Infants ages zero and one, young juveniles ages two and three, older juveniles reaching sexual maturity ages four and five, young adults, sexually mature, but still physically growing, ages six to nine, and adults, fully grown, ages 10 plus. As random effects, we included subject ID to avoid pseudo-replication, but also because we wanted to look at repeatability. We included month of data collection, year of data collection, and a group term representing different alpha male tenures. We also included an ID within year term to look at short-term repeatability within a year. In order to partition maternal effects, we included the identity of subjects' mothers. We also included an additive genetic variance component. Let's briefly look at the fixed effects in our model. Group size and seasonality both had an effect on our sociality measure. The interaction between age and sex also had an effect on sociality. If we plot the estimated marginal means for age and sex separately, we can more easily see a few take home points. One, male infants start off more social than their female counterparts. Two, sociality decreases with age. And three, sex differences largely disappear by adulthood. Now we will spend more time understanding the variance components in our models, the random effects. Remember, we started out interested in the repeatability of our behavioral measure. If, there, if we were to consider a model that only included the identity of our subjects as a random effect, we would see that subject identity would account for roughly one third of the variance in our sociality measure. If we plotted the posterior distribution of the ID term, we would see that there was a low to moderate repeatability in our behavioral measure. However, once we include additional random effects, our point estimate for repeatability decreases. Now, why is that? For one, repeatability has now been partitioned into both a shorter term and a longer term repeatability. The proportion of variance explained by repeatability across years is close to 0.21, while the proportion of the variance explained by repeatability within years is about 0.13. So what are the take homes here? Moderate repeatability accounts for approximately a third of the variation in our trade 
And this repeatability can be broken down into both a shorter term repeatability within years and a longer term repeatability across years. Importantly, we also can see that male alpha tenure, year of data collection, and month of data collection also account for considerable variation in our behavioral trait. So can we further understand what is contributing to the moderate repeatability that we see? To what extent might the repeatability be explained by maternal or additive genetic effects? Let's return to our models. What happens when we add the identity of subjects and mothers to our model? We see that much of the repeatability appears explained by maternal effects, or in other words, by similarity between maternal siblings. Now, what about additive genetic effects or the proportion of phenotypic variance that is due to genetic variation? We can see that repeatability also appears largely explained by additive genetic effects. So we have evidence for both maternal and additive genetic sources of variation. However, it is important to note that because individuals that share more genes are also more likely to share maternal environments, values for both maternal effects and additive genetic effects can be overestimated. For that reason, it's important when possible to account for both within the same model. Indeed, we get lower estimates for both maternal and additive genetic effects when they're measured in the same model. In our final model, we can see that repeatability, mainly the long-term repeatability, appears explained by additive genetic effects and to a lesser extent by maternal effects. I would like to point out that our final model captures the majority of variance in our behavioral trait of interest. While individual repeatability captures about a third of the variance, it's important not to overlook that most of the variation likely comes from temporally changing social and environmental factors. While some of the variation may be measurement error, much of it is also likely to reflect environmental constraints on our sociality measure. Studies on repeatability across the lifespan are rare in mammals. But thanks to the incredibly difficult and complicated work done by researchers to manage field sites and keep them running for decades, we now have more and more detailed observational demographic genetic and hormonal information on study subjects across lifespans. It really feels like the sky's the limit now for asking and investigating really complex questions. In this study, I presented data on a very coarse grained measure of sociality. I hope in the near future to look at more diverse types of sociality measures. These other measures could reflect dyadic properties of sociality, such as relationship quality, or it can involve a more social network approach to have a better understanding about social integration within groups. I want to thank Lara Munez and Linda Vigilant for their contributions to our genetic data sets. Hannah Gilkinson and Vipka Lammers, who spent considerable time managing the field site, and Don Cohen, who created our MySQL database. We have many funding sources to be grateful to, and I want to send a huge, huge shout out to all the dozens upon dozens of field assistants who have worked so hard to help us amass the amazing data set that I now have the privilege to use. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>